This is my Amiga 2000 build, or more accurately my Amiga 2000 EATX build. And inside that case there, there are multiple expansion slots that up until now have done very little. There is one card in there, there's an IDE card, obviously connected to a hard drive so that I can run Workbench. But beyond that there's four Zaro slots with nothing in them and there's a video slot. And it's that video slot in particular that I want to pay attention to today. You see at the minute what you're looking at here is RTG graphics coming out of the Pi Storm. This is running at a resolution of 1280 by 1024 and doesn't it look fantastic? But if I want to run a bit of software that uses the Amiga's native RGB output, such as Road Avenger here, well I need to change the input of the monitor over to VGA. There is the game running, but this monitor itself does not support the 15 kHz signal coming out of the Amiga. Rather, I've got another bit of kit in behind there that's scan doubling this to 30 kHz so that I can display it on the screen. Said bit of kit is one of these, a GBS 8200. Now, as we all well know, this rather budget entry level scan doubler, it does the job, but it doesn't really provide the best picture possible. There is a mod you can do to this called GBS Control that is meant to dramatically improve the image quality. But there's also another mod we can do to this to mount this internally inside the Amiga 2000 on that video port. Before we do anything though, let's take a closer look at the picture quality derived from a stock GBS 8200. I'm not going to run Road Avenger to show you this because, well, Road Avenger is a fast moving game. The graphics move fast on the screen and that in itself goes some way to hide the problems. Rather, let's take a look at A-Train. So we'll just skip through to the main menu. And I want you to pay attention to the cursor, the black cursor here. See as I move it across the screen, you can see almost like a glitching around it. In fact, if I come down here over the menu buttons, see like a shimmering effect there, just around the cursor. Is that artifacting caused by our GBS 8200? If I go into the game, Well, the colours produced by the stock GBS, I think they just look a little bit washed out. Now you can't tweak all this, there is a menu within the GBS, you can change the brightness, contrast, saturation, all that good stuff. But I'm just showing you it here, stock, as it comes out of the box. The other thing I suppose is the sharpness of the image, which again you can change, you can increase the sharpness, but as it comes stock, it does look a little bit soft. You can see that shimmering effect again around the cursor there. But one thing that people have said about it is that it introduces lag. Now what you're looking at here is from Amiga to the GBS. Then from the GBS I have a VGA converter going into my capture card. And with all those levels of processing, I cannot detect any lag in this whatsoever. As soon as I click the button to scroll the screen, it scrolls. And certainly with a setup like this, I have tried playing you know, platformers or beat-em-ups, any sort of game. And honestly, for me anyway, I did not detect any lag. But putting that aside and instead focusing on the image quality. The stock GBS, well, I think it does a pretty good job to be honest with you. Especially when you consider all this costs. But equally, to do the GBS control mod, there isn't actually that much involved. So let's start there. Let's do the control mod and see if it improves the picture. 
GBS control itself requires nothing more than one of these. An ESP8266, this is a little Arduino device. We're going to be following along on the GBS control wiki. Let's start at the beginning, intro. The basic install, well it describes what we need to do. There's just a few wires that we need to run. There's a jumper we need to close on the board. But before we do any of that, I want to get this programmed software setup. I have already done all this but I'll just run you through it very quickly. So you need to download and install the Arduino software. Add this address here into preferences in this section, additional boards manager. Go to tools board board manager search for ASP8266 and install that. Use version 2.6.3 do not use version 3 or newer. Need to select our board. Now I'm not sure which one that actually is. So as it suggests here, if you're not sure, just select that. That's what I have done. Apply these various settings. You need to download these two libraries, or in fact those three libraries, and stick them into your documents, Arduino and libraries folder. You may need to create that libraries folder if it doesn't exist. I had to create it. And then download GBS control, compile and upload. So I have it all here sitting ready to go. Let's hook this up to the computer. Let's make sure we select the correct COM port. That's COM6 in this instance. Upload. Okay, that should be it done. That's the difficult bit done as far as I'm concerned. That's just a matter of running a couple of wires. There are a lot more things in here though. We'll come back to that in a minute. Going back to the basic install on the wiki, we need to run five wires from the GBS to the ESP. Four of them we pick up from this unpopulated pin header here on the GBS itself. 3.3 volts on ground. Now it does recommend on the wiki to not use this. I suggest getting 3.3 volts from elsewhere but I've checked it with the multimeter and it's putting out just a fraction over 3.3. I think it'll be fine. So pick up power and ground there. These outside two labeled SDA and SCL. They need to run to positions D1 and D2 on this. And then the fifth wire that we need to run, we need to connect the debug pin of this chip here. It's the second one in from the left on this side. We need to run a wire from there to position D6 on this. We do need to close that jumper though. Let's just do that now. Before I go running any wires though, you can see that the ESP that I ordered here, it has these two pin headers on it. I'm going to remove those. They'll just get in the way. I don't know what has happened to my Duratool desoldering gun, but it definitely isn't sucking as good as it used to. So I'm just gonna pull all those pins out. Much better, easier to work with now, because I want to mount this onto our GBS, sort of in that position there. It's going to mount it with a bit of double sided sticky tape. But before we do that, I want to just connect up the wires that we need. We need to take a wire from the debug pin, just using this fine wrapping wire. But that should be more than adequate for our needs here today. Gonna leave this with plenty of length for now and we'll solder on the other wires that we need as well. So 
So as I said, I'm going to mount that in there. Just going to put it on with a bit of blue tack for now, just to hold it. I don't want to make it permanent just yet. But that is effectively going to wind up in that sort of position there. This wire comes from the debug pin and has to go to D6. SEL, that has to run to D1. Ground, has to go to ground. VCC goes to 3.3. And lastly, SDA goes across to D2. Okay, all done. Let's test it. So we'll hook up the video signal from the Amiga. Pick up the VGA to the capture card. And some power. Light came on. I suppose that can only be a good thing. Atrian. Let's just skip through to the menu again. And that looks absolutely awful. What is going on? Why have we got all those vertical lines? Now we can connect to this, that ESP8266. It has a Wi-Fi adapter built into it and it's actually broadcasting a Wi-Fi network. So if I go on my phone into the internet, yes there's only 4% battery left on this but let's see if we can get this done quickly. GBS control and the password is QQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQQ
on our version 4 from what is shown on that version 5. It doesn't actually label in the wiki here what capacitor that is that we need to remove, but it is that one. Capacitor C11. Now take that off and fit this electrolytic in its place. There we go, there's that off. Just tidy this up with a bit of wick. And then we can try and fit this. Now this is obviously a three hole part, we need to fit its surface here. But rather than trying to go onto those pods where we removed that capacitor, the regulator sitting beside it here, I think it would be easier to make off onto that. That cap we removed just sits between VCC and ground on the regulator here. So rather than trying to fit the through hole part onto those small pods, we can just fit it onto those legs there of the regulator. Okay, new capacitor fitted. I do need to come clean about something though, because this GBS 8200 here, this is not the same one that I used earlier to record that bit of footage. Rather, that one is actually still glued to the back of that other monitor. This is just a spur one I had. It is exactly the same board though, GBS 8200 version 4. I've just had this one sitting spare, it's been lying in storage for quite a while. And it was just easier to use this to apply the mod to. So it's not withstanding the possibility that the problem we're seeing on the screen is nothing to do with any of this, but you know, might have something to do with the GBS itself. Maybe there is a fault in this. But new capacitor fitted anyway. I do want to just test it quickly because fitting this cap in particular is meant to again further improve the image quality. Okay, let's take a look at it. Where's A train? Here we go. Nope, it's still full of those vertical lines. Oh well. I really hope this is not a faulty GBS. Wait a minute. Why does that change when I push on that chip? Hey! Hey! If we push really hard on this chip, that fixes it? I wonder do we have a bad solder joint around this IC? Well, where do you see this? Loose pin. Another loose pin. That one's okay. And there's another loose pin there. All the rest of them do seem to be okay. But I think what I'll do is just reflow this entire side of the chip. In fact, I might just reflow the whole way around it. Just to be sure. But I would say that is definitely our problem. At least three loose pins. How would that have happened? Or is this came from the factory like this? That's the only thing I can guess. I was pretty sure that I have used this before, but it has been lying in the parts bin for quite a while. But let's reflow. We'll just load a little bit of solder onto the iron. And just gently drag across this. Actually it wound up reflowing two sides of the chip. I went right round it. And as well as that side there that had loose pins. This side here is down in this bottom corner. There was another three or four pins just not attached. Let's see if that solves our problem. Yeah looking good. Perfect. So that's all it was, dodgy joints on that chip. First class quality control there for whatever factory this came from. But it does now give us the opportunity to compare the video quality against what we captured originally. And we're not finished yet, there are further mods that we need to do to this. But just take a look at the cursor. So if I move it about, there still is a little bit of glitching, but I don't think it's as bad. 
Although certainly now, if you move the cursor over those buttons on the menu, you no longer see that sort of shimmering effect over it. GBS Control has fixed that. In the game, uh, the colouring looks pretty much the same to me, to be honest. But I do think the image is slightly sharper. The lines on these buildings here, on these blocks, they just look slightly sharper to me than what we had previously. I don't think there's a lot in it though, to be honest. The main difference, the jump out, is the shimmering is gone around the cursor. Still just as responsive in terms of lag. Seems pretty much instantaneous as soon as I click the button, it scrolls. So fantastic, it's looking good, but still more to do. The next thing is these, the RGB potentiometers. On the wiki, it asks us to turn all three of those as far as they go left. But, scroll down this page, it does say that ideally they would be removed. Other old inputs slash outputs bridged. This would be the correct termination resistance to the TV standard 75 ohms. So let's get those out and get them bridged just like this. So I'm going to try the Moo gun on these again, but I'm going to heat the board as well. Some of these points here are terminated onto this massive ground plane, so this might be difficult enough to get off. All right, let's see if this is going to work. Yep, that has cleared that hole fine. Yeah, this is working brilliant. This one here though, this is onto the ground plane. And yeah, that has worked. This seems to be the way to do it. And out they come. I think I'll keep those. You never know when you might need a little potentiometer. And so looking at it like this, we need to bridge between there and there. At each of those positions. Input to output. And I'm just going to use some resistor legs to do this. All done. But before we leave this area, I do want to skip ahead ever so slightly on the wiki. If we go down to section 7, the hardware mods library. This is basically a list of essential and recommended modifications. The essential mod that wants us to add a 100 ohm resistor across sink and ground for the RGBS input. This corrects the sync level for 75 ohm sources such as games consoles. Now I'm not actually sure if this is required for our Amiga, but I want to do it anyway. And what it's talking about is putting a 100 ohm resistor between those two points, sync and ground. At the minute, the reading between those is what, about 800 ohms? So way too high. If we wrap a 100 ohm resistor around this just roughly at the minute you can see there that brings that down to 88 ohms so a lot closer to spec which should be 75. the whole thing though is governed by this resistor here r34 and looking on the wiki the second mod down here is to replace r34 with a 75 ohm resistor that provides permanent 75 ohm termination instead of fitting this resistor. Now, I don't have any 75 ohm SMD resistors, but if we remove that one, I'm thinking that we can fit a 75 ohm resistor just between those two points and it should do the same thing. I've made a mess because I was worried I was going to do that. I have moved this capacitor. I may have to fix this with a bit of flux and hot air. 
I've turned the airspeed way down here so to hopefully not blow any components out of the way. Any of the other components that we don't want to move. Okay, that has moved back into position, but there's a bridge. In fact, no, it hasn't moved. I've moved it into the wrong position. I've moved it into the position of the resistor. You silly boy. That should be there. But it is bridged onto the points for the resistor as well. The easiest thing to do here might be to remove that cap. Let that cool for a second, then we'll wick up all of that solder and just refit that cap again. The lesson here is just take the easy route and fit the 100 ohm resistor. Right, fixed. So with that resistor removed now, that should be open. And yeah, it is. But that pod there, that's ground, so that shorts to there. The other pod, that is the sink. That shorts to there. And while those positions are far too small to fit a 75 ohm resistor to, one like this anyway, we can fit this over here. And that should, I think, give us the proper 75 ohm termination for the sink. Resistor is now fitted and we've got 75 ohms, or pretty close to it anyway. 74.7. If we measure over here on those pods where we remove that resistor, yeah, just the same. So we now have correct termination of the sink. Let's just make sure it still works. Have the mods improved the picture any? More interested to see what the colours look like. Are the colours more vibrant now? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Or perhaps it's more just that the whole image is brighter. But yes, I would say it is another step up in quality. Not a lot left in this box of parts, just some capacitors to fit. There's the card that will eventually go onto this to install it within the 2000. And there's this clock generator. I want to do this thing next. This will be mounted just to the top of this heat sink here. If we take a look at the wiki, the SI5351 clock generator install notes. So it's just a couple of wires that we need to run from SEL and SCA on our clock generator here over to this chip. And then we need to pick up power and ground for this. We do that from that resistor. And then we need to pick up a signal from the last pin on this large IC here and take it up to there. I'm conscious that this video is getting on in length, probably running over 28 minutes now. So let's just get this done quickly. A little bit of double sided sticky tape will help hold this in position. Then it's just a matter of running some wire. So this mod is meant to stop tearing in the image when outputting higher resolutions. I have it outputting a resolution of 1280 by 1024. If you remember previously when I moved the mouse pointer around, there was a little bit of tearing on the screen. You could see it in the mouse pointer itself. But now it all looks fine. No issues whatsoever. Everything looks grand. Just one more mod to do to this and then we can put it in the 2000. We need to fit some more caps. If we take a quick look on the wiki, it is this one here. Number 10, power supply bypass capacitors. 
One recommended modification to the stock GBS board is to add more capacitance for power supply bypassing. This step can reduce some forms of visible noise. So it recommends that we add a couple of caps, I think it's five of them in total, and put these in parallel with capacitors C42. That is C42 there, so in parallel with that, and then C48. I wish I had told us this before we put those wires on, because that's going to be a complicated. On the underside then, it wants us to put capacitors across the legs of those three electrolytics. Here's a thought. Capacitor C42 there, that's in a very busy area. Might be difficult to work beside that without running the risk of moving something else, which I definitely don't want to start mucking about with again. But that cap buzzes out to this one here as well, C46. So we could just put one beside that. And then equally, this one here that it recommended we put the cap on, C48. It's actually in parallel with C47 there, just beside it. So we can put the two capacitors on those two, and it should do the same thing. On the underside then, if I just orientate this the same as the picture from the wiki, it is that point, that point, and that point. Those three that we need to fit the caps across. And as I said, that is the underside of those three electrolytics. So has that made any further improvement to the picture? Um, nothing that I can see anyway. Yeah, it still looks just the same to me, to be honest. But I suppose it wasn't hard to do, so recommended by the wiki. It's done. Even if it makes the tiniest improvement, it's worth doing it. Well, it's finally time to do the fun bit. Let's modify it with this so that we can fit it inside the Amiga. This little card here was very kindly sent to me by Pillock. That's the name he chose for himself. I'm not calling him a Pillock, just to clarify that. But he sent me this, must be quite a while ago now. Let me see. Yeah, it was back in December last year. He sent me this, so apologies I'm only getting to it now. But you know what it's like. You get these projects, they sit in the box, and you know, you'll get to it one day. So this mounts to the back of this, like that. We have various solder points that we just need to flow a lot of solder into, really. We don't actually need these ports on this. And these buttons, in fact, those buttons now do nothing. But I'm not going to remove them. I think removing all that, I mean you could remove that there as well I suppose, and just fit that resistor into the holes. But if I remove all that, this board is going to start looking very bare. So I'm just going to leave all that in place. Make it more interesting, won't it? Before we do that though, we do need to fit a couple of jumpers to this, just here. So that we can select between composite sync or HV sync. Now with that mounted like that, we could fit the jumper there, could we? So I'm going to clear that old VGA port, even though we'll not be using that port, but yeah, that should work okay, shouldn't it? Or maybe it would be better to have them on the other side, you know? Just so that if I ever wanted to take this out of the machine, I could use the VGA port again. Yeah, let's do that. Let's fit it to this side. And for our part anyway today, we're going to be using the composite sink, so I need to fit this jumper there. Now, one potential issue here. Remember we did this mod here to fix the sink level? 
to give us 75 ohm termination on the sync signal. Well, maybe you should have read the instructions before starting, but you know how it is. These two resistors on the bottom of this board, those are doing the same thing. Those are there to correct the sync level. So I'm not sure, I might have to remove those. We'll try it first. I can't always take them off later. So this goes on there like that. There are arrows here, as you can maybe see, denoting all the points that we need to solder. And then once we've done that, we do need to run a cable for power. You see power is provided at this point here. I've got this little cable and just cut those ends off. Make that off into there and then that will plug in there. Well, that's it, but that sink I think is going to be a problem. Because we measure across it now, it's only 43 ohms. So way below the 75 of the spec. I think what we need to do here is remove this 100 ohm resistor. So if you're going to be doing this, either don't do the mod that I did there, or do do that and don't fit that. At least I think that's going to be the case. Let me see if I can get it off here without melting anything. Hopefully we're 75 ohms across this again now. Yeah. Let's put it in the 2000. The video slot in the 2000 isn't keyed. This car could go in like that, or could go in like that. I would assume it goes in like that. And anyone spot the other problem? VGA out? How do we go from here to over here? I think for now I'll just have to run a cable through. But I'll have to come up with some sort of bracket to go in here with VGA port on it. Well, let's test it. And let's just stick to A train. Now, I do still need to change the input on the monitor manually. But there it is. Fantastic. The image is all off to the side though. So let's jump onto the GBS control app. So despite that being in the case over there, I am still getting strong enough Wi-Fi connection from it. No issues there. We're currently outputting a resolution of 1280 by 1024. The next option up is 1920 by 1080 full HD as it used to be known. But I can't really select that here because that monitor doesn't support it. The image is all off to the side though, so we can move it. That looks about center there. There is an option to scale it, obviously. We could stretch the image, but I think it's fine as it is. What do the scan lines look like? Yeah, okay. It's a thing. It's not really for me, to be honest. I would rather just have the clear image. So yeah, all seems pretty cool. Loads of options here. I will have to read up and see what all this does. But I have to say, I am really happy with it. Just as it looks. The image is crystal clear and super sharp. I'll stick an image on screen now comparing what we had originally to what it looks like now. And well, what do you think? The first thing that jumps out to me is just how much brighter the image coming out of the GBS 8200 is compared to GBS Control. I originally accused that of having colours that looked a bit washed out. When you see them side by side here, well, I'm not so sure that statement holds true, to be honest. The colouring from the GBS 8200 is certainly more vibrant than what's coming out of GBS Control. That said though, the image sharpness and clarity on GBS Control is significantly better than that out of the original card. You can see more definition in the graphics on the screen and even looking at the menu system at the bottom. On the right hand side, all the text is easy to read. On the left hand side, okay there's no text but there is those icons. 
and they all look a bit of a blur. If I swap the two images over, well you can see that the text in the menu system on the right hand side now looks a little bit soft, whereas those icons on the left hand side, they sort of come into focus. So while out of the box GBS control maybe doesn't have as vibrant an image, I would still say overall it is a better image. If you want to intensify those colours again, well you can always do that with your monitor's controls. Well what do you think? Is GBS control worth the hassle? The scan doubler itself at the minute costs about 30 to 40 pounds. Everything you need to modify it, that's probably another 10 pounds or so. So for 40 to 50, you can have yourself GBS control. Of course, if you don't fancy doing it yourself, there is people selling pre-made kits. You can even buy them on AliExpress. And I think they come in at about 50 to 60 pounds or thereabouts. So yeah, even if you can't do it yourself, that might be an option, buy one pre-made. Now, I have nothing else to really compare it to. I've only got those cheap SCART to HDMI converters. I suppose the real test would be to compare the image quality to the likes of the open source scan converter. Not something I can do, but if anybody has one and by chance has GBS control as well, well, please let me know how the two of them stack up against each other. The other thing that I'm sure you're wondering is that we didn't really cover everything in the wiki. I only covered what you need to do really. There are other articles in that wiki, some of them no longer apply. There is one other mod, a sync stripper, but I don't think it's necessary. Certainly not necessary for me, I have no issues with sync here. But perhaps if you're using your GBS externally with games consoles and if you do have any problems then that is a further mod that you might need to look at. But I'm really happy with how it turned out and sure if nothing else it fills a slot inside my Amiga 2000. Still plenty of empty Zaru slots in there though. I do have two cards lined up to build. So why not hit subscribe and you'll maybe catch those videos at some point in the future. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.